All right. Again. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to your COVID-19 communityresources.com town hall meeting powered by the Center for Closing the Health Gap. I'm Tropicana um, and uh, my wonderful co-moderator, Miss Jan Michelle McKerney will be joining us shortly. I am thrilled that uh, we are getting an opportunity to have this great conversation. We'd love to hear all of your questions and comments as we talk about COVID updates, the new strains, the vaccines, and more. If you have the vaccine, we would love to hear from you too. Just enter the comments and questions in the chat on the Center for, Center for Closing the Health Gaps Facebook Live or Q&A on the Zoom. Let's give a great shout out to our producers and tech team, John and Lauren Harden, for making sure all of our technology runs smoothly. Thank you guys. As a reminder, we are recording this session so that we can repost it on the COVID-19 communityresources.com website and other platforms. Um, to all of our attendees, please start entering your questions into the Q&A on the Zoom or into the chat if you are on the Health Gaps Facebook Live page. Um, and let's actually turn it over to our panelists and get a quick introduction from them. Dr. Shomo from the New Cincinnati Medical Association. She's the president. Hello, how are you today? Good. Can we, would you like to just open up with a few words? Um, so I am a family physician, family medicine physician. So I work in primary care, getting a lot of questions about the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine and doing my best to answer those. Um, and I've been talking about my experiences with it as well. I have received both of my vaccines at this point um, as of last Friday. Um, so I've just been sharing some of, you know, some of the reasons why I got that and my experiences with it with my patients one-on-one um, -on -one in the office, but also want to make sure we reach out to the community as well. Absolutely, really all about your experience with the COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Clyde Henderson from the Cincinnati Medical Association. How are you doing, Dr. Henderson? Fantastic, how are you today? Thank you for joining us. Can you share a few words with us as well? Sure, sure, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I um, was raised in Cincinnati since age three. I'm a product of Cincinnati Public Schools. I, I graduated from the greatest high school in the world, Walnut Hills High School, um, engineering degree at Northwestern, followed by a medical degree and orthopedic training at the University of Cincinnati. Then I spent uh, three years in the Army, came back into practice here for uh, 33 years in Cincinnati in orthopedic surgery. And after I retired in 2018, because I had a family and a community that helped me so much, it was time for me to continue to give back. And when this pandemic uh, came along, I really kind of hooked into uh, learning a lot about the uh, um, whys and wherefores and realized immediately that our community, which has been so um, much um, affected by the healthcare disparities, was also gonna be affected by the disproportionate burden of COVID-19. So I've been writing articles and researching and just trying to bring uh, the benefit of my um, knowledge as information to people, information is power. And so that all of those who can uh, at least will be willing to listen, will listen to this and then make a uh, decision on their own as far as what they're gonna do about uh, vaccinations. So, and, and I've had my uh, first dose of the uh, vaccination as well. Everything went super. I'm waiting for my second one in about uh, nine days now. And so I'm looking forward to uh, being on the panel. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to hearing more about your experience as well. And of course, we have Dr. Lou Edgy, the Associate Dean at UC. Hi, Dr. Edgy. Hi there. Thank you for inviting me. How would you like to share a few words this afternoon? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this platform. And I do want to thank the University of Cincinnati um, for trusting uh, me with the message. Um, I come from this uh, informed from a couple of different perspectives. I do have four deaths that occurred in my family, one prior to me joining the Moderna trial. And that was really one of the things that sort of catapulted me to get involved. Um, so I did start the, the Moderna um, vaccine trial and had my first dose September 12th and my second one October 14th. I didn't find out until that um, until just the first week in January that I actually had received the vaccine. And um, I had a little bit of suspicion that I had because my arm was really heavy and I figured the placebo would not have given me um, a heavy arm like that. Um, so I, I, as a black woman as well, I live in a family that has, um, you know, black women who are elderly black women who've really experienced some of the history 
um, that is in our past around clinical trials and some of the uncomfortable truths um, about uh, things that were just not right with things like Tus Tuskegee, for example, and um, some of the other egregious events that occurred around experimentation. So I understand the perspective and really um, welcome the opportunity to answer any questions, um, realizing that any discussion to try and um, help people understand the science isn't a critically important one. Hello, it looks like we lost Dr. Edgy. Okay, well, um, she'll be joining or rejoining us shortly. And I guess we can go ahead and start with some of our questions that we have for today. Um, and this is for both of our doctors on the panel today. Black and brown people have a higher mortality rate for COVID or from COVID, but we are less likely to get the vaccine. Can you kind of speak to that? What do you think is going on with that? Dr. Henderson or Dr. Shamo? I would say first, for me, the, the question is, they're less likely to receive the vaccine when it's offered, or they're less likely to be offered the vaccine, would, would be a clarification. That would be a great question. I think that, uh, well, one thing that I know for sure is that people are very hesitant about receiving the vaccine. Do you, do you uh, have any knowledge as to why or why you feel like they are? People are very suspicious of um, the healthcare system just because of systemic racism and the history of that in this country. Um, I think a lot of people have been, a lot of people have been um, very, I don't know, weary of how fast the vaccine has come out. Mm -hmm. um, so when it first, when, the, when it initially came out, I guess in December, as physicians, we were sent a lot of information as far as webinars that we could uh, learn more, all that sort of thing. So I think that for me as a physician, I went and read a lot of the data I read, um, you know, what they studied because for some people, um, there's different endpoints. So the way studies are designed, oh, hey, learn about. Oh, Jan Michelle. Hey, Jan Michelle's here. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, Hi. we can hear you. I am so sorry. <laughs> Welcome. Thank I, you. I had all kinds of tech problems this morning. How's everybody doing? We're doing pretty good. We're doing great. Right. Fantastic. Dr. I'm excited to hear from everybody. Absolutely. Dr. Shema was just sharing with us about the hesitancy around the vaccine. Um, but now that you're here, Jan, we got a question from a listener name uh, or a participant named Nia Foggy. It's a great question. She wants to know, um, she's currently four months pregnant and she wants to know, is it recommended that I get the vaccine while pregnant? Also, is there a current vaccine administered yearly like the flu or is this gonna be just a one-time vaccination? So that is, um, so we have been to a lot of webinars just to learn more about the science and learn more about, you know, a lot of different things. Um, and I think that one of the things is that a lot of people in the public don't have access to the same tools that we have as physicians to, to get the right information. So that's part of why we're here to, you know, share what we've learned about it. Um, because we didn't go and get the vaccine without, you know, learning about it, you know? <laughs> so it's one of those things that of course, this is a new pan, you know, this is a brand new situation that we have going on. We want everybody to be informed, but we have to first inform ourselves um, so that we can, you know, spread the message to other people. But as far as pregnant women go, I'm a family doctor. I don't, I don't do prenatal care. I don't deliver babies currently, but I have in the past. And one of the biggest things is we, there, that was not, there was no study for pregnant women. In the studies, in the, in the Pfizer and the Moderna study, there were women who became pregnant. Um, so I know that's a big thing that you know people are worried about. Can I get pregnant after taking this vaccine? Um, yes, there are women who are in the study who did become pregnant later, um, but they did not go out of their way to study pregnant women. They're currently doing those trials now because that's just the way the vac that's just the way the vaccine trials are done. Um, yeah. is they first they study non-pregnant, non-children, and then they move on once they determine it's safe. They move on to include those groups. So my biggest thing for pregnant women. Is to talk to your OBGYN OB doctor about it um, because you know it's just one of those things that. Can you turn on that light, Dr. Edgy? And, and following up uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Shomo, the, um, there, it's very important that you talk with your uh, obstetrician um, because every case is going to be different, um, and, and there, the studies are ongoing. 
but one of the um, things that we did find out is that women, when they're when they're pregnant, uh, if you happen to get the COVID-19, then your chance of a uh, complication is much higher. So there's good reason to still get the vaccination, but you need to check with your uh, your obstetrician before you make that decision. Dr. Edgy, would you like to swim in as well? If you could go ahead and give me the um, start of the conversation. I'm sorry, my technology failed me. What was the question? I didn't hear that. No, we had a, a question from Ms. Foggy. She wanted to know, is the vaccine recommended for pregnant or expectant mothers? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And of course, as a mother who um, has a daughter, I, I'm very concerned about what moms think and as family physician, especially as well advising mothers. Um, so a couple of different things. Um, I use the analogy that the DNA that is your genetic makeup is locked in a safety deposit box in a thing called your nucleus inside each of your cells in your body. And so that's um, the instruction on how to make another Dr. Edgy, for example. And um, when you use mRNA technology, which the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines both do, um, the mRNA has zero access, zero access to that lockbox. And so even though it does tell your body um, the genetics of the virus um, so that it will be able to respond to the virus and make antibodies um, to fight it when it sees it in your body for real, um, that mRNA has zero access to the nucleus and therefore has zero access to alter either your DNA or the DNA of your um, unborn child. So because of that, um, the folks that made the Moderna vaccine um, have recommended that if a woman does want to go ahead and have a baby, that they can go ahead and um, get that vaccine again because getting COVID is much more deadly to a woman and her fetus than getting anything with the vaccine. Wow. Well, thank you for clarifying that and giving us that information. We have some concerns and some questions that uh, Jim Shell actually prepared for us to, to ask. So I'm really excited to get these answers because some of these were some of the conversations I've heard in the barbershop when I take my son to <laughs> get his hair cut. One of the things that men are afraid of is the ability that COVID, the COVID vaccine may cause infertility. Is that true? Anyone that would like to address that? Yeah, that's what I was saying before, because they were saying there have been a lot of women who have been worried about that as well. Um, so I guess to what Dr. Edgy was saying that there would no, be not there would not be a reason that it would cause infertility. Um, it doesn't affect your body in that kind of way. And um, and I've heard that about other vaccines as well, like HPV, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. It's just I don't know why there's this myth um, about vaccines causing infertility, but that is not that is not the goal of vaccines, um, and that is not how they work. There, there would be no reason they would have a mechanism that would affect fertility. And so there have been plenty of people who've gotten pregnant after getting the vaccines. The trials have been going on for over a year um, at this point, or about a year at this point. Um, so they've, they definitely have people who've gotten pregnant um, for, for men and women um, after receiving the vaccines. So it's just, it's just a myth that's out there that I don't know why it's out there, but um, I think that people will be concerned about that, but that's that's definitely a myth. We're all doctors on Facebook. <laughs> also, uh, the, I mean, again, and this is an excellent question because I mean, perpetuating your lineage and your legacy, of course, is really important to all of us. Um, so, one thing to note, even though it's unethical really to enroll um, pregnant women in these sorts of trials. Um, quote, to be first in line and test the draw, you know, the um, vaccine before it was rolled out to the public. What did happen with the Moderna trial is that um, even though we enrolled women who were not pregnant, of course, nature happens. And we had 23 women who did uh, go ahead and become pregnant during the trial anyway. And so Moderna has been keeping track of those women and they have been doing very well. So even though it wasn't something that we wanted to have happen at all, um, those women are doing well with tracking just because nature happened um, in those relationships. That's actually really uh, encouraging. I wanted to follow up with what uh, Tropicana was saying about some of the questions we're getting. And, you know, another big question is, will the vaccine actually give you COVID? Some people are really afraid that getting vaccinated means that they'll actually get COVID from the vaccine. The the vaccinations are are not uh, are not live, and you cannot you cannot get COVID nineteen from the vaccinations. 
it's just, as Dr. Edgy was saying, you're getting um, for the uh, messenger RNA uh, vaccines, you're getting a, um, a, a particle, which is not even part of the uh, vaccine. It's a message to your own body to make a, a protein, which your body then recognizes as being also on the COVID-19 uh, virus itself. But you, you cannot get the virus from getting the vaccination because you, we're not injecting any part of the virus into you with the vaccine. Yeah, I like, I like to give analogies. <laughs> and my analogy about the way this particular mRNA vaccine is uh, made is that it's kind of like having a wanted picture. So it's like flashing to your body a wanted picture, like we want this suspect. If you see them, turn them in immediately. So it's kind of, you know, showing a picture to your body of this is, if you see this person, you know, arrest them or apprehend them. So it's kind of in that, in that sense, but it's not actually that person being there. Um, it's, it's just a picture. That's a great analogy. That's that a is great. a good analogy. I love that. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like D Dr. Edgy talking about making the cake and that, you know, let's, let, let me just jump to that real fast because, um, you know, the other thing, unfortunately, the name of this whole process has been Operation Warp Speed and people are like, oh, this is just too fast. You know, you're, you're making us guinea pigs. So that makes me think about Dr. Edgy when you were talking about we've been making this cake for a while. Take us back to that one. Oh, absolutely. And uh, honestly, of course, my husband is an attorney, so he has nothing to do with medicine. And, and when I said, you know, my stepmother's passed on, I'd really like to be a part of this trial. You know, the first thing he wanted to do is to make sure I wasn't going to be getting the virus. And uh, we'd only been married a year, uh, not even a year when I, when I entered the trial. So um, he wanted to make sure there was no um, virus in it at all. And there isn't. Um, and of course, I like the analogy as well, um, you know, that, that Dr. Shomo had mentioned. But the, the concern that I've heard a lot from folks <laughs> It was just way, made way, way too fast. Um, are you sure you want to get involved with this? It was done way too fast. There are a couple of different things. One, um, a lot of vaccine trials have about 5,000, 10,000 people in them. The Moderna trial had 30,000 people. The Pfizer trial had 44,000 people. And J&J, &J, which is one of the new ones that is um, just released its information on Friday, a different kind of um, vaccine, but it also... Um, has around 44,000 people in it. So these are much, much higher numbers of people involved. So that's the first thing. And secondly, um, as far as coronaviruses, this one is part of a family uh, called coronaviruses. And we've been studying coronaviruses for about 20 years now. And um, so really, essentially the puzzle on how to handle this had been, had been made. It, the cake had been built. Um, it had already been baked. And all we had to do in the first 66 days of this um, pandemic was actually to find the recipe for the icing to go on top of that. Um, and it took 66 days for us to figure out what the genome, what the genetic makeup of that um, spike protein on the outside of the virus is, and then start the trials. And th that was just like icing the cake is all we've been doing for the past um, 11 months, just before it got approved um, by the FDA. So. Cake's been baked for 20 years ago. All this information, we knew exactly where to look on the outside, specifically for the spike protein, and then find the detail about the spike protein um, right off the top. So I like that cake analogy as a way to reassure people this was not done in any hasty way at all. Dr. Edgy, I have a, a follow-up question to your comment about the coronaviruses and having being, them being studied for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, after I get off these lives, I go and I repeat everything that you guys say, and I just look like the expert in the room, but then they ask another question and I don't have the answer. So We share knowledge and then it becomes <laughs> yours. <laughs> um, so when I share that information that the coronaviruses have been studied for 20 years, because I just like to argue, no. No, that's not right. They've been studying coronavirus for 20 years. Well, the follow-up question was, why yeah. haven't we heard about coronaviruses before? Have we had coronaviruses yes. before and we just have not mentioned or talked about them? Can you kind of so speak? Here's the difference. I think we definitely have. So SARS and MERS are both coronaviruses. And so a lot of the studies were, you know, for this one were based on that. But um, both of those two things had the potential of becoming pandemics just like we have here. But I think there was a completely different national um, approach to handling those, and those were nipped in the bud. And so what did not happen was um, a situation where we've got 
this multiplying um, significantly, having these surges, and then out of each area that's not controlled, now all of a sudden we have these variants come out as well. The longer this goes on, the more the viruses learn and mutate and, and learn how to figure out, huh, they've worked out the spike protein, let's figure out how to evade the vaccine. Let's figure out how to bamboozle the vaccine. The longer this goes on, the longer that will happen. The reason we've not heard about coronaviruses in the public in general is because those were handled well early. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I wanted to say something Tropic on Ann, that, can, can, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I think Dr. Shomo was speaking. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. I just wanted to say two things on that note. Number one is the common cold is a coronavirus. So coronavirus, we don't really? necessarily call, we don't necessarily call like everything in medicine has different names, and we don't necessarily always talk about that in the public. Like the chicken pox really is a herpes virus. So it's called herpes virus. I can't remember which number it is, but there's herpes, eight herpes viruses and that sort of thing. So there's none those names that we use in, in doctor ter terminology and the names that they are used in the public. So the, the common cold has been around forever and it's the coronavirus, but we just don't call it that. We call it the common cold. <laughs> and so the other thing is that this particular coronavirus, like SARS and MERS and a lot of other vaccines, I mean, a lot of other um, um, coronaviruses that were mutated needed a vector. Um, so a lot of these, um, they're called like zoonotic viruses. Um, so they generally need some kind of vector kind of in between, in between us in order to spread it. But with the, this particular coronavirus, it didn't need one. So just the way that it was able to spread easier. So it mutated in some kind of way where it could go direct, direct to human without needing a vector in between. Um, so when you think about a vector, you think about like maybe like a deer tick. So, you know, usually ticks aren't on humans. They are on deer and then they get onto humans and they can cause issues like Lyme disease, that sort of thing. Um, but this particular, so that's why a lot of times they really didn't spread as much. But this is a, you know, this this coronavirus now that we have um, had that big difference, which made it really easy to spread without having a vector. You know, another thing that's that's pretty scary that you know we've heard this week a lot of is about these other strains. First, we heard about the strain in the UK, and they said, yeah, it's more contagious, but not really deadly. Then we started hearing about a strain from <clears throat> South Africa and one from Brazil, and now the one from Brazil is in South Carolina. You know, and those sound like they're they're more deadly. Then they wonder, you know, well, and we wonder, will the vaccine? take care of that. So can you all give us an update on that? Because that's all scary news coming out. Yeah, so um, the B117 is what came out of Britain. And as I mentioned previously, what these mutations tend to happen in areas where the virus has become out of control. So prior to the mutation coming out, you heard this, you know, um, there were some issues in Britain where they were getting overrun um, and then, you know, the South African one, um, B1351, that came out again, the same sort of situation. And then you have a P1 and then you have an L425R, which is actually out of California. And you've heard that LA is having a significant problem. So again, wherever there's something out of control, that's when things start to spin off. Um, the, the new vaccine um, that will hopefully be approved um, in the first part here of February um, is by Johnson & Johnson. And that one actually was tested in multiple different areas, three different continents, including South Africa, where um, the, the South African vir uh, uh, mutant was found. And so it has actually been, been tested, unlike Moderna and Pfizer that were very, very early, it was actually starting to be developed and tested on folks when that new variant was around. So we do have some numbers on how well it's responding. Um, it's it's fifty percent, seven percent effective um, in sub, on the South African variant, the J and J one coming out. We know that just because it was able to be tested on that. Um, we don't know about the others, but we do um, anticipate that the mRNA, um, so Pfizer and Moderna. Um, should be able to handle um, at least the, the first two variants, um, the B117 and um, the, the other one, um, South African and Brazil and, um, and Britain. Well, the, you know, uh, it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Henderson. I'm sorry, the, the, um, the, the UK variant, the British variant is already in the United States in over 28 states. Um, oh. and, the, um, and it's the 
messenger RNA um, vaccines seem to be effective against it, at least in the test tube, if you will. And it was, so the experience will tell us whether or not it's uh, effective uh, as far as the human population is concerned. The good news about the messenger RNA vaccines is that if they find that uh, the current one is not um, uh, effective against that new variant, then it can be manipulated, it can be adjusted, uh, and then uh, a revaccination can be done, or the ones that haven't been administered can be changed so that they can take care of those variants. But right now, what we what we seem to um, what seems to be indicated is that that the vaccines that we have are going to be they they're going to be effective against that variant. Now the um, the South African variant has been found in South Carolina, and the problem with with that is that th those people had not traveled, so there is some community spread there. It's somewhere in South Carolina, or they got it from someplace else without going to South Af um, South Africa. So that and that one could be a problem for the new vaccine. And the Brazil variant is actually in Minnesota. And that person, the one case they identified there, uh, that person had actually traveled to Brazil. So we're not sure about the community spread, but there's a reason why that person could have gotten it elsewhere and brought it back to the United States. But the so you know what? I, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ed, you go right ahead. Yeah, so the one thing that I am, I'm concerned about is that we're not testing for what genome people are getting. So what type of variant? Just like, you know, we're not testing here in the US as much as we should be to determine exactly what um, mutations are being exposed here. They're picking up things um, here and there, but it, we should be doing a lot more testing. Yeah, so, you know, so here's really, you know, here's here's what I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of our listeners, and I'm just thinking, wow, there's so much information, all this new stuff is happening, and, you know, there's just a lot of distrust. And, and remember, and Dr. Edger, you were on this show several weeks ago where we had some people on who said, first of all, they started by saying they weren't going to take the vaccine, like they just were not going to take it. And then by the end of the show, they were like, okay, maybe, you know, we want more information. But, you know, there's a lot of mistrust out there. And I think part of it is like, you know, we keep hearing about new vaccines and, you know, 50% effective. And, you know, wh what are we going to do about the um, distrust? You know, what, what what's your take on that? So for me, personally, what I try to do is just be honest about not necessarily that I mistrusted the vaccine. I just wanted to know, you know, I just wanted to know the data um, and I wanted to know the facts. So I think for a lot of people, you know, you have to try to, to deal more in the facts versus the conspiracy. Um, because for me, I was interested in that, um, separating the, the noise from what's actually happening. Um, so I think you have to start there um, and then for me personally, you know, I share my story of like, you know, I was just kind of like, well, you know, this vaccine is pretty new and we don't know all the effects of it, but I know that I've gotten plenty of other vaccines and I've been fine. I've had every vaccine. I get the flu vaccine every year. I've had MMR. I've had, you know, we've had, as doctors, we have to get all the vaccines in order to be doctors, right? So I have faith in that I've been fine with all of those vaccines and I have faith that I will continue to be fine with this vaccine. Um, and for me, it was just a matter of, you know, yeah, there were a little bit of side effects. I experienced some side effects um, from the vaccine, but I know how bad COVID has been. We have 400,000 people that are dead right now. I remember one of the biggest things for me when this, when this first happened in March of last year, my husband and I were, you know, it was in, in March. Uh, we were out. We have a lot of fires at our house. We have a patio with a, uh, a fire pit. We we're out hanging out by the fire. And my husband was on call and he got a call that a 40 year old person died of COVID that night. And I just remember feeling like, oh crap. You know, we literally wrote our wills. Um, we got our healthcare five attorney paperwork together because we are not that much younger than that. There are plenty of people in their thirties and their forties who are dying of COVID. And for me, that is way, you know, that's the biggest thing that a lot of people don't they talk a lot about the vaccine and all these variants. We hear a lot about the death, but we're also not even hearing about the long-term effects. You know, the, the, lung, the lung issues, there's people on dialysis, um, people having strokes. I have had friends who've had strokes my age, um, having strokes after COVID, um, you know, just all types of effects, millions and millions of people who have been affected by COVID and nowhere near that amount of people who've been affected by the vaccine. So it's just a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of noise out there about the variants and this sort of thing. 
And so for me, I just tried to weigh, you know, trying to find out as much facts as I could and trying to weigh that with knowing that this is an emergency. We're dealing with an emergency virus um, that we don't know all the effects of how that's gonna be in the, you know, 10 years from now, we won't know all the effects of how people's hearts and lungs and, and kidneys and everything are going to be. Um, so it's just one of those things of trying to, trying to understand that we are not talking about, we're not talking about, you know, lightweight situation right now. We're talking about a dire situation that is an emergency and that we have to do something about it. I think because of all the numbers that we see on TV, we just see numbers. We haven't seen faces. And for some reason, I, I just don't know if it's just the generation that we live in now. It's like we've become desensitized that 400 deaths does not actually equate to 400,000 people dead because we don't know their names. So people are not taking it as serious as we should because people are so desensitized. Um, and I, I, I admire you guys so much for just stepping up to take part in the vaccine trials. Dr. Henderson, can you kind of speak to that? I think you said that you were um, nine days out from getting your second dose. Yeah, I was not in the um, in the trial, but I did get uh, vaccinated. Uh, and I have um, the, after my vaccination, the, the first one I had, I had the Moderna and uh, it was in my left arm. A little sore that evening, but that went away by the following morning. I was able to work out the following morning. I did my regular workout without any difficulty and I'm scheduled for the uh, second vaccine. And in fact, I am very much looking forward to the second vac uh, vaccination uh, in about uh, nine days. So to be four weeks between, the, between them, that would be the interval. And that's important to me because I, I can, you know, you talked about the 400 and actually the 435,000 people, Americans dead now. Um, and, but there've been, I have lost family members as well. I have uh, people who have, um, um, suffered uh, or suffering from some of the long-term ill effects. And then if you just get away from the healthcare concerns, you look at the, the economy and uh, our, our businesses have been shut down disproportionately. Our kids are out of school and they can't get back in school. They, they can't get the virtual educations that they need because we don't have access to the, the things that are needed for virtual education. And we need to do something as soon as possible um, after adequate research. And I think we've done the research as, health, as healthcare providers and that research tells us that these are safe, effective, and we need to pass that information on to folks. And some people will still not be believers, but nevertheless, we can impart information because knowledge is power. And hopefully the majority of people will see that they need to get one of these vaccinations. Thanks. Absolutely. Yes, Dr. Edgy. So one of the things that I, yeah. So one of the things I think is important as well to note is that um, there, there was about eight weeks between the end of the phase three trial you know, for Moderna, which is the last part, the trial piece, the people who enrolled in the study before they were able to actually go ahead and show that to the FDA and get approval. And the reason for that window is because um, usually you'll, any adverse events that you're gonna have um, are gonna happen in that particular window. So they had to wait for that to happen. Also, as far as immunity, which means how long these vaccines are actually gonna work, um, usually you'll know within um, four months if a vaccine is going to still be immune and still working for you four months after you've received it and giving you antibodies, then it's probably going to give you um, protection for at least a couple of years. And so when I go in for my shots, as I'm still in the study, they take eight vials of blood every time I go in and they check to see, do I still have a response against this? And I'm past my, I'm on day 139 today of being in the trial and um, I'm still doing well with it, with the, the amount. And again, this is past four months. So that means if, if I had my antibodies and they've kept up for that period of time from the vaccine, then it's more likely that it's gonna have lasting um, effect um, at, at least for a couple of years. And so I'm enrolled in the trial for the full 25 months. The other thing I think as far as trust goes, these discussions are not one-offs. I mean, this is not gonna be something that happens um, on its own. Uh, the NAACP did a fantastic study. Um, it was a coronavirus vaccine um, hesitancy in black and Latinx communities. And that study showed that black and Latinx patients trust their caregiver twice as more likely if 
twice they'll trust their um, caregiver twice as more likely if they are the same gen um, the same um, ethnic ethnicity as they are. So number one, talk to your black doctor or your Latinx physician. Um, that's the first thing. And number two, to go ahead and have more than one discussion. It won't be one time. Uh, now I trust. It is show me. And so again, we've got 150,000 healthcare workers here in the greater Cincinnati area, including frontline workers and EMS. And as we have become vaccinated, because we were in the first batch, the 1A batch, and you see us walking around Kroger and getting our hair cut and, and going to the salon and doing well, that also should be evidence to you. I, you know, I got mine, my second one was October and here I'm doing just as fabulously as I could possibly be, feeling well, feeling energetic. I have continued, I've not actually had a vacation day since then and I'm doing just fine. Um, so the point of the matter is again, um, not a single person out of every one of the 30,000 in the, um, the Moderna trial got severe COVID or got hospitalized. Right. That, that's, that's important. Yeah. And that protects our hospitals and prevents us from getting overwhelmed. Right. You know, let me, let me get to a few questions. Um, Tropicana and I are getting some questions here from Facebook. One of them um, is from H. Taylor. And H. Taylor says talk about the J&J, &J, I guess that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and how it uses the killed virus. Is that so, so J, yeah, so J&J &J is completely different than mRNA technology. So it's a completely different technology. Um, so that uses the a common cold virus. It's called adenovirus 26. And what it does is it takes the virus and I hate to use this term, but it castrates it so it cannot replicate, it cannot reproduce. And then it gives, it adds a little piece in there that is the spike protein component. So the instructions on how to make the spike protein, that's wrapped up and it's injected into your body. And then your body's able to recognize that little piece. Again, it can't replicate, it can't do any damage in your body, but it, is, it exposes your body to, um, you know, to that spike protein, and then you're able to go ahead and make a response. So that is a little different. It is a cold virus that has, has been inactivated, so it can't, um, it can't do its own thing. Um, but that is, is really called a non-replicating um, viral vector. That's the kind of vaccine it is. And that's the same kind of technology that's being used for the AstraZeneca um, vaccine as well. Is but the bottom line is you cannot get COVID you cannot get COVID from any of them. Okay. Not any of them, none of the candidates that are out there right now, uh, none of the four candidates. Again, these last two, J&J &J and AstraZeneca, are not yet approved um, for use here in the United States. Okay. And then Deb asked the question, um, if you've just had back surgery, so maybe this is if you have any kind of, you know, I'm going to say back surgery, you know, chemotherapy, you know, some kind of treatment surgery, should you get the vaccine? There from the standpoint of any you know, surgical procedure, um, there's no reason why you cannot have the, uh, the vaccination if you've had a, um, had a surgical procedure. Um, but it, so um, again, you need to be protected. And the thing, before they, had, before they had their surgery, I'm sure they had testing done, but still they need to get the vaccination uh, as, soon as, as soon as their turn comes um, and to protect themselves and their family from the, from the virus. Okay, all right, good to know. Uh, for sure, if you have, um, you know, if you have an immunocompromised status and so forth, you do want to have a discussion, you know, with your physician if there are specific concerns that you do have. Um, we know uh, Moderna in particular tried to make sure that they had a wide and represented um, sample of people who were in the trial, both from an ethnic standpoint. In fact, they halted their study to make sure that the, we're just going to enroll um, black and brown patients from here on out, because we wanna make sure that the number of people that are in the trial reflect the number of people in the community so that when we finally get approval for this, that people can't say it wasn't tried in us. How do we know it doesn't work in us? Um, so that's one thing that's really important. Okay, and then Dr. Shelmo, I'm gonna throw this question to you, but someone is saying, you know, if we get the, um, the COVID vaccine, do we still need to get a flu shot? Yes, um, so the biggest thing this year is that there hasn't been as much flu because everybody's been wearing masks uh, for the most part and staying home, so it's helped with the flu. Um, but yes, the, the, they're completely different viruses. 
Um, so you definitely have to get the flu vaccine. But one of the questions a lot of people ask is, are we going to have to get this vaccine every year, like we get the flu? Like, are we going to be getting the coronavirus uh, vaccine at the same time we get our flu vaccine, two vaccines every year? Um, and the answer to the question is, we don't know. You know, this is, like I said, this is an emergency situation that we have not experienced, you know, recently um, in the past, you know, recent years. Um, so we don't, we don't have all the answers. And I think that's part of the reason why people are somewhat hesitant. Um, but for me, it's just one of those things that we don't know, we don't have all the answers of COVID either. Um, there's so, been so many weird things that COVID can do. Like I saw a story about someone with their, their tongue completely swollen. Um, so we don't know all the things that COVID can do either. You know, it's showing us all types of things, but I think I'm gonna take my chance with the vaccine, you know, cause they're keeping track and they're monitoring. Um, and you can go on their, you can go on their website. I mean, you can go to the studies and see, you know, what was common. And there was people who also have asked, you know, the ingredients, and that's all on the fact sheet. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of different places where you can get correct information, but I feel like a lot of people are just, you know, a lot of people are very suspicious of a lot of things, um, but I feel like they should be suspicious, just as suspicious of the coronavirus too, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm more suspicious of the coronavirus than I am of the vaccine. So I'm gonna stick with that because it has information there. You know, I, it's been studied. I can see what it's going to do, but there's just so much about the coronavirus that we still are studying and we still are, are learning. And, you know, it really makes sense to me. You said um, 400,000 people have died from the from, from the virus, from COVID. Um, I've heard at least one person has died from the vaccine, but that's a lot less than 400,000. But do we have any information about that, about, you know, like severe effects from the vaccine? I just want to be, you know, just throw it on out there for people who are thinking about that. So nobody in the Moderna trial died from, uh, from the vaccine, nobody, so. Yeah, so that would be my question is, I haven't heard that anyone has died from the vaccine. I know that there has been, you know, questions about how people have died. Um, and they're still trying to determine some of some of that information, but as far as I know, they have not linked the vaccine to any deaths. Um, I know that it is something that they study. There were people who died. I feel like of other reasons in the study, people people have heart attacks. And all, I mean, heart disease is the number one killer of people every year. Um, generally, I don't know about this past year, but um, heart attacks, strokes, that sort of thing, kill people all the time. So I think that there were people in the studies who may not have been even fully vaccinated who um, died of, you know, those sorts of things. But it's hard to really attribute um, the vaccine to people who are not, you know, completely healthy in the first place when they're trying to make sure they include a lot of people in the study. Um, so it can be, so as far as I know, no one has died from the vaccine. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people have died from the coronavirus um, itself. I have to uh, echo, I don't know of any circumstances where they, they have attributed a death to the, vac to the vaccination. And sometimes when a high profile person dies, like um, unfortunately, uh, the great uh, Henry Aaron, Hank Aaron died uh, last week and he had just been an, being an ambassador, got his COVID-19 uh, shot a couple of weeks before that. And so people automatically made that connection. But people, right. people are, are going to, to die, unfortunately, and they have not linked anybody's death, as far as I know, to, to the vaccination itself. Okay. All right. That's okay. really good to know because that's another rumor that's been going around. And so I want to make sure we, you know, we get all that out. And one of the ways that we also keep track of things is, for example, um, Bell's palsy. That's a question I've gotten from a lot of people. And that's a viral condition whereby half of your face becomes paralyzed by, by a viral exposure. And so what we do is we look at the number of people who would normally have gotten Bell's palsy even before COVID started, like before the pandemic. And we look at, was that any different in the number of people during the study who got, um, who, who got um, Bell's palsy? Was that different? And for Moderna, it was four people. So it was the same as it has been, whether the pre-COVID or not pre-COVID. And um, all the people who got it were not actually in the side of the trial that received the vaccine itself. So they, none of them had re received the vaccine anyway. So, you know, again, that is one way that we look at things and say, okay, did that number bump, you know, in the study as, com you know, compared to outside of the study? And the answer was no. And that's really good to know because that's, that's, that's a misinformation that, that tends to get out there and then, you know, rumors start going and then people get afraid of the vaccine. Tropicana, I'm sorry, go right ahead. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I 100% I agree with that. I know that 
part of that that war on misinformation that we have is the fact that people are taking a part of the story and adding their own expertise to it. We've heard a million times that they were fine, they went in and they they died and then they just said it was COVID. So there's definitely um, a level of distrust that is coming from the misinformation. So I'm glad that you asked that to clear that, clarify that. I have a, a question that I wanted to ask personally, but I'm so glad someone else is thinking like me. They said, why aren't children catching and sp spreading COVID-19 at the same rate as adults? And then my question um, piggybacking off of that is, I've heard that children are getting COVID, but they are having different symptoms. Can we kind of, can you guys speak to that a little bit, please? Absolutely. So um, yes, kids do get COVID and um, my youngest patient who had COVID is seven months old. Um, so they do get it. And there are studies right now, Pfizer actually has a study here in town at Children's um, trying to see if they can find a vaccine um, that can be used in children under um, 16, because Pfizer can go as low as, as 16 as far as uh, it goes right now. Um, kids do have a different presentation in certain situations. There's an inflammatory um, presentation that had been occurring in several children. And we do know that children can carry it to other people. So even if um, you know they may not manifest it in the same way, they can carry it to grandma who can then become very ill and possibly pass on. Um, so, you know, that that is one important thing to note. And so again, all the things that we know that have actually saved us so far, um, making sure that you're wearing your mask, making sure that you are socially distancing at least the length of a full bicycle, a grown up bicycle, and that you're washing your hands and don't forget to do the motorcycle. I call it the motorcycle, don't forget to wash your thumbs. Vroom, vroom. I mean, that is like a critical piece. A lot of people miss the germs that are on their thumb. You know, here's a question from Facebook, and this is from uh, Callista Hardin Smith. And she said, um, after you get the vaccine, what masking and social distance behavior should you practice among others? I know people want to get that vaccine and take that mask off. You know, what do we think about that? Even after you've um, gotten the, vac the vaccination, you still need to wear your mask. Uh, masking is going to be extremely important um, because you're not, uh, we, 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 don't, we don't know that the vaccination prevents you from actually be, um, still being a carrier of the uh, of the virus, so you can pass it on to uh, to other people. Um, and so, even though you may not, the vaccination will prevent you from getting um, sick. Um, it's not necessarily going to. We don't know if it's going to prevent you from spreading it to somebody else. Because, so, it is extremely important that you continue to mask up even after you've had the vaccination. Right. And I, I think that it's important for people to understand that when we, when a lot of times when vaccines are studied, they are trying to, the end point would be preventing death, preventing hospitalization. Um, but if, if in order for them to go around and swab everybody every day to see if they have asymptomatic infections would be a lot of work. Um, and it, you know, may not have as much of an impact on, you know, what we're trying to do as far as preventing hospitalizations and death. So the biggest thing that, you know, for a lot of people is that they feel like, well, you all go get the vaccine and I'll just wait here until everybody gets vaccinated and I'll be fine. But I'm not, that's not necessarily true because if, if we have not studied asymptomatic, um, you know, carrier status and people who are vaccinated, that means that the people who are vaccinated are protected. We have a 95% chance of, you know, getting, uh, you know, of not getting the virus, uh, only a 5% chance of, of becoming symptomatic with the virus um, and a even lower chance of having any issues like hospitalizations. So it protects us, but as far as other people, um, you still are at risk. So that's why, you know, we, you know, just put that out there that you can do whatever you want to do. You can get the vaccine or not get the vaccine. Um, but just know that if you don't get the vaccine, then you're not necessarily protected. Um, you're not necessarily protected by everybody else getting it because it, yeah. you can get the vaccine and, and it, you will have issues and other people won't. And, and the thing I think is important, and I, it cannot be stressed enough, is that we need to have 70 out of every 100 people get vaccinated for this to burn itself out. If it doesn't happen like that, and we decide, okay, half of us are not going to get it, and half of us will, across the globe, in fact, what will end up happening is we, this will be here for a long time. And what will happen is we'll get more and more variants, and before you know it, Moderna won't work against the variants and the variants will be the main thing out there now 
and Pfizer won't work against the vet and so on and so on and so forth. So there is not only an importance of everybody getting vaccinated, but we need to do it fast. We need to outwit and outfox these variants because the more out of control things get, the smarter this, this virus will become. It will start to mutate. We'll have a ton of different variants and then we'll have to start making new vaccines, altering new vaccines, having additional shots. And um, we never wanna be in that situation, but that is where it's going right now if we don't step up and get it taken care of. Yeah, oh my goodness, we have got to get rid of this thing. Well, so so Dr. Edgy, you're saying 70% of the population needs to get vaccinated. Does anyone yes. have no idea how, what's the percent that's been vaccinated so far? Where are we in that? Uh, I think, so we have Dr. three, Dr. yeah, so we head. have okay. 330 million people here in the United States. We're in the 43 million vaccinated range. Mm. 43 million. Is it likely that 330 that need, if everybody was 100% to get done, that's how many we have to have done. So we've got a long way to go. Well, we're not close yeah. too. I don't know how many, I don't know what the number of uh, it, like children that we have. What is the number of children that live in the in the US in that 330 million? Because they're I not don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, they're that's not eligible. Question. They're not eligible for it. They're, the not they're not eligible yet, but I, again, i yeah. working on that and I expect that um, we'll be getting vaccines for them at some point here. Right, because as, as you just said, children can, can spread COVID. Absolutely. So they're under vaccination. What is the likelihood that we'll actually be able to reach the goals that the administration has set forth of 100 million vaccines in 100 days? So um, basically right now, they're actually going ahead and seeing if they can go ahead and um, use a defense act, which actually um, is a it, we're in war territory as far as things go and mobilizing things um with the urgency that is needed this is not a, a ball game this is a very serious pandemic and um people are dying every single day you know four thousand people here four thousand there that's a lot of folks and their family members of ours so i think the, the urgency from what i've seen from the administration um is definitely realized um and so they're already looking at potentially tripling that number with a, within 100 days. So, you know, instead of doing 100 million, doing 300 million is, is what the goal is. And again, that's vaccine this into arms. And of course, if it's going to be the Moderna or the Pfizer, that's going to be two vaccines each. If it's J&J, &J, um, Johnson & Johnson, that's just one. If it's AstraZeneca, that's two again. So. Problem is going to be the supply. Yeah, that would be yeah. we, don't, we don't have the supply as of yet. Um, and with the uh, Defense Production Act that Dr. Edgy talked about, then maybe we can increase that supply more rapidly. Uh, Merck has abandoned their efforts at developing a vaccine, and there's some negotiations going on whereby they may be able to produce the messenger RNA vaccines, which would increase that supply much more rapidly. So that would make it hopeful that we'll reach that, uh, that, that number of vaccinated before the summer. But with the current supply, it's going to be fall probably before we would get everybody vaccinated. But there should hopefully be some other vaccines coming online and, and approved, as Dr. Edgy was mentioning before. Yeah, so the J&J &J vaccine um, for the rest of the world, um, that seems to be a much easier vaccine. Uh, number one, it doesn't have to be refrigerated um, in sub-temperatures. It can be refrigerated at regular refrigerator temperatures. So um, vaccinating globally and people not having to have real fancy freezers, that is a benefit. Number two, it is actually cheaper for you know, countries to buy the vaccine, even though we don't have to pay for it as individuals. And number three, it is one vaccine. Um, it is less effective. It's still very, very effective, but it's less effective than the other two um, mRNA candidates that we've discussed, Moderna and the Pfizer. Um, but, I, but I think as far as looking at the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, and thinking about getting this to other countries like South Africa and everything else, um, number one, it's been tested against some of these variants. And number two, um, if, if you got one shot and it gives you, you know, good coverage with one shot um, and you don't have to have all the strictness around how you store it, then that is something that is um, definitely a positive. Um, I was going to okay. say, too, the, the data came out last night for um, the Johnson & Johnson. It said that it was 85% effective at preventing severe COVID. So it's a little bit less effective at preventing mild to moderate symptoms. 
um, but 85% effective at preventing severe COVID, which is a little bit less than the, than the mRNA, um, but it helps for people who are skeptical of the mRNA um, and people who don't want to have two injections. So it kind of can, even though it's a little less effective, um, still, still very effective, I mean, it's still a good option for people who, um, who want to go that route. So Okay, you know, million doses of that. I mean, we, we just need all the doses we can get so we can get this done as fast as we can. But the biggest thing is the sooner we can get people to buy into being able to get it, the sooner we'll be able to get rid of this coronavirus. Because like I said, there's a lot of people who are like, well, you all get it and I'll wait. And it's just like, that doesn't help anybody. Well, to, to, <laughs> so, no, to, to that issue, Anissa, the thing about it is, is that, you know, the people who are like, I'm going to wait. Well, let me just say, you're not first in line. I was first in line. All of the people who were in the phase three, three trials decided, let me be the guinea pig. I'm going to take the risk. I've looked at all these packets of information. I'm going to be first in line so other people don't have to wait. Okay, so anyone who thinks they were first in line, they weren't. And we, you, um, okay, so there are 30,000 of us who stepped up in one trial, 44,000 in another, 44,000 in a, yet another one right. who've already stepped up and proven right. that amongst all of us, these are safe and they work. Right, and then there's 43 million people who've gotten it so far as well. So like, I don't know what people are waiting for, but it's just like that logic of, I'm just gonna wait for you all to get it. It's not gonna help you. Right, right. Because because people are getting it, like you guys who are in the trial and then people who are getting it now and, and really they're, they're, they're doing fine. And that whole fertility thing, people have been in the trials getting the vaccine and gotten pregnant. So that's just evidence of that, you know, it's not going to kill fertility at all, right? So, Tropicana, any other rumors we've been hearing? I know, you know, we're, we're about ready to close out and I see um, Renee is, is coming on, but I just want to make sure we, you know, we, we hit these rumors. I think that Dr. These and Dr. Shomo and Dr. Edgy really spoke to the majority of um, a lot of the rumors that we have seen this week. Um, I think there was just one question I'd like to ask um, in closing as we are switching over to Ms. Renee Mahaffey Harris. Do we get to pick the vaccine that we want or do you just get what you get? You, you, we don't get to choose. We don't get to choose the one we want. You're going to. You're gonna get a shot at getting a vaccination, and you you should you should take it when you get that shot. So, um, yep. whichever one is available is the one you'll take. Okay. And you need to take the same the same um, family as you did before. So, if you took Moderna, you need to take Moderna for your second shot. If you took Pfizer for your first shot, it'll be Pfizer for the second. If it's J and J, it's just one shot. If it's AstraZeneca, it needs to be AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca. Again, J and J and AstraZeneca have not been approved just yet here in the U.S. Okay. Thank you guys okay. so much for joining us in this time. I actually have a question. I'm sorry. I have a question. So I was going to say there was conversation about teachers, but teachers are getting vaccinated now. So I'm sorry, I'm going to turn it over. Go right ahead. No, I just had a question, a follow up to, to Tropicana's question. So, how do people know that they're taking the same second shot? So, they should have a card. Okay. And they will need to take it to wherever they go. And of course, okay. You know, if you want to get vaccinated via um, UC Health, you don't have to be a UC Health um, patient at all, um, but you can go ahead and um, and go ahead and call 513-584-DOSE. And they are going to be going ahead and um, scheduling people. So right now, if you are 70 and above or a teacher, you can go ahead and um, call that number and they'll start scheduling for folks to get the shot um, the 1st of February, which would be Monday. So 70 and above. Dr. Um, give us that number one more time, please. Yes. Five, Dr. One, Edgy, give us that number. Yep. 513-584-DOSE, as in the dose of the vaccine. So D-O-S-E. So 513-584-D-O-S-E. Well, we'll make sure that we post that number on the COVID-19 community resources.com site. I know we are a minute over. Um, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Shomo and Dr. Edgy and Dr. Henderson, and of course, our outstanding moderators, Tropicana and Council Member Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney. Um, you are each helping us get information. Like you said, it's not a one stop. So we thank you for our partnership and helping educate our community. And as we're trying to get people to the place where you get information that addresses the myths you hear so that you can have 
the right information, the factual information to be informed in making the decision to protect yourself and others by getting the vaccine. So we will see you on February 13th for our next town hall. And we thank you all. Thank you, Drs. Henderson, Shomo, Dr. Edgy for being here. We are in this together and we must work to save us. And so I thank you all and you all have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye-bye, everybody.